the Asheville Area Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank you all for being here today. I also want to express appreciation for the level of collaboration that has occurred between the public and private sectors during this crisis. It's one of the silver linings of this moment. And the town halls we're holding today and to, that, that we're holding today and tomorrow, we still got, we've had a total of nine. The last one will be on professional services tomorrow afternoon are another example of how we've worked together. So let's talk for a minute about what this meeting is and isn't. This meeting is about giving the health department the opportunity to listen to business owners about your ideas and best practices around safely conducting business as we continue to deal with COVID-19. It's also a time for them to hear about the things that you haven't figured out yet whether it's where to obtain masks or sneeze shields or gloves or how to ensure social distancing is accomplished or any of the hundreds of other issues business people have to deal with while operating during a coronavirus. What this meeting isn't, it's not a time to lobby the health department about whether or when we reopen or not reopen. You won't come, a, come away from this meeting with a, a deadline for when you should prepare to reopen either. What you will get is a better understanding of how the decisions will be made. And we are recording these sessions and we'll be asking you to make use of the chat feature to give your input. That will allow the health department to have a literal record of what you've said. And as I said, we're doing nine of these in, in a week. So the transcript from the chat feature will help Plus, if you have ideas and it, that you could submit, questions you have, or links, you can post those in the chat and they will literally be there when we post these recordings. Today, we'll hear from Fletch Tove, the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Director for Buncombe County. And then we've asked representatives of the industry to come join us as conversation starters who may spark ideas or questions you want to pursue. And we'll ask a series of questions that we'll ask you to respond to in the chat feature so we get that transcript. We hope that by doing this, we can identify any community-wide barriers that we need to address, that the health department will have a better context for decision-making about businesses reopening, and that you, as owners, will start your preparations for reopening so that you're ready whenever that day comes. I also want to let you know that we'll be collecting, that the, what we're collecting here are ideas. Just because we discuss an idea and like it does not guarantee that's the way things will go, because ultimately these are, these are public health decisions. So let's get started. I'm going to ask just for the purposes of this meeting that everybody mute themselves during the conversation so that we don't have any, um, any uh, unplanned outside noises. And we're going to start with Fletch Tove from Buncombe County. Fletch, can you give us an update, please? Yeah, good, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be on this call with you. So I'm gonna start off and giving everyone a snapshot of where we stand, both with the state and in Buncombe County right now going forward. So uh, last week, um, Governor Cooper and uh, Dr. Mandy Cohen, our health secretary laid out some metrics they're observing to determine when the time is right to start uh, reopening. Um, they also laid out their three-pronged approach on our roadway to a roadmap to a new normal. Um, the three big trends there, uh, we need to look at um, increased testing for everyone, increased capacity for contact tracing, and consistent downward trends. Locally, um, we're slowly able, been able to increase our testing capacity, um, not as quickly and as bigly as, as, or as to the extent we'd like to, but slowly as more providers are offering testing and more resources come online and more supply chain issues are resolved, we are seeing increased testing capacity in Buncombe County. As far as contact tracing, we've developed a pool of uh, qualified people for that. As the state rolls out their platform for that, they're gonna have a statewide platform and their training will be quickly able to stand up 
um, to meet those needs. And then trends, um, we're taking the same data and metrics the state is looking at, we're pulling those at a local level so we can uh, mirror and emulate those trends here locally to see how we're doing. So we're making progress in all three of those prongs to get us to reopening. Um, that kind of set the stage for Dr. or Governor Cooper to lay out his phased approach to reopening. Um, phase one will start with um, some small lifting of restrictions, um, some, some extent of commercial and retail openings. Phase two is where the majority of the uh, reopening is gonna happen. That's where he, he intends to lift his stay home order. So that's gonna open up um, restaurants and some other industry to a further extent. And then phase three, um, again, increased opening, getting us to that new normal. Uh, a couple of things I wanna talk about that. One, as you can see on the slide, um, he set some windows for how long he expects each of those phases to last. As you can see, um, assuming everything is best case scenario going forward, um, we're looking at making this decision to go into phase three late June, early July. So just want everybody to understand that as we talk about these phases, this isn't a May issue. This is a May, June, July solution of the phased openings. The other thing I want to point out is we're getting a lot of questions about the, how the phases will work. And unfortunately, what the governor presented last week was just a real skeletal framework of what they're planning. We're hoping later this week or early next week to get some more details on the specifics of what is entailed in each of those phases and some specifics for each individual sector. So um, unfortunately, I can't answer a lot of questions today about, you know, are you gonna have capacity limitations on the building? Are they gonna limit class size? Are they gonna, you know, what, what are gonna be the guidance for gyms or salons or barbers and things like that. But hopefully as we get more guidance from the state, we'll be, we're, our intent is to align with them. Um, I know in the past, Boca County's had a little bit more restrictions in place in the state. Um, we're signing a new local order today to ease some of those restrictions to get us closer, more closely aligned with the state moving forward. So that we do start doing these phased reopenings. We're, we're just in, in lockstep with the governor. Um, with that, that's my update, and I'll be around later to answer some more questions, but I'll turn it back over. All right. Uh, let, me, let me talk real quick about this. So uh, when we talk about preparing to reopen, some things are going to be with us for the rest of the year and into next year. Um, we know we're always going to have physical distancing as an aspect of our daily lives for the foreseeable future. Um, we know um, cloth face coverings will probably be playing a big role to some extent. We know there's um, sanitary and hygiene practices. There's some, some resources on the screen right now for, and this will be shared with you, but the CDC guidance for how to clean and how to disinfect, and then there's EPA guidance for approved disinfectants specifically for coronavirus and COVID-19. There's also just general guidance for businesses available from the CDC. But um, going forward, and this is part of the discussion, I'm interested to hear about what some of, some of you guys have been doing or thinking about, but if there are capacity limits, how do you schedule that out? What do you do with staff? Are you able to set staff on different shifts? Are you able to um, you know, spread, spread apart classes more to a different extent? Are you able to do more stuff virtual? Uh, do you have capacity maybe even to do some stuff outside where you have more area? Um, things like that. So as we get into the conversation, I'm interested to hear, hear what your guys' ideas are. And um, I like, we're going to really try to follow the governor's guidance, but, you know, we do have some discretion to do stuff either above. We can't be less restrictive than the governor, but we can't be more restrictive, but we can be creative in how we apply that. And I'd, I'd like to hear your ideas and how we can help you guys as we get to an acceptable place for you guys to start reopening. Well, that is a perfect introduction to our next section. Um, uh, we've got four professionals with us who are willing to not just offer their ideas, but their questions around things as conversation starters. And uh, I want to introduce them. Elizabeth Maylander with Sola Salons. Elizabeth, wave your hand so people know which one you are. Um, she's got Sola Salons at, uh, in the downtown area. Uh, Kevin Kropp with Club Pilates, Biltmore Park. Jen Locke Charlton with Sensibilities Day Spa, who I believe has two different locations, and Arnaldo Alvarez with Hard Exercise Works. Uh, let me tell you, you guys, I 
have such a desperate need for all of your services. It's not even funny. Uh, and I know in talking with my friends, everybody is desperate to get exercise going again, to get their roots done, to take care of their nails, to get a massage. There are all kinds of things. So personal services are so important to our daily lives. Um, Elizabeth, why don't we start with you? And how about sharing your ideas that you've come up with about how you're going to approach getting back to work? Thanks, Kit. And um, Arnaldo, I think we're also neighbors. I own the um, solar salons down on Hendersonville Road, too. So I have both of those locations. Um, you know, we're a little bit of an anomaly as far as uh, personal services go because we actually, Sola is home to 25 independent boutique salons in each location. And those are all fully enclosed spaces, um, different sizes, but they are able to close the door. They all have separate ventilation, that kind of thing. In terms of, you know, starting to approach the process of reopening. Certainly we're going to do um, comprehensive cleaning in both locations. We're also doing training with our independent salon owners and requiring them to certify at least in the barbicide training. And there's um, probably another training that we'll ask them to do. Um, and then just in terms of, you know, there'll be some I guess we, we already clean six mornings a week, so we will up the ante in terms of the, the you know, kinds of products that we're using based on CDC guidelines. Um, we usually tend to use green products, so we'll probably have to use things that are maybe a little bit more, um, more astringent um, in nature, but we'll do those things. And then I think that for us, the, the challenge will just be managing the flow. You know, I know in some um, in some solo locations that are owned by other folks in other parts of the country that are starting to open, one of the things they're doing is, you know, locking the front doors. And basically, um, salon owners are admitting clients as their appointed um, time for their appointment comes up. That way they can make sure that they've all allocated time to clean their studios, their salon studios between every client. Um, so I think it'll probably, as it rolls out, it will probably be just a difference in um, the rhythm of their day and in their approach. You know, a, a lot, a, one common salon practice is that you have one person in, in, you know, a guest chair in your salon while their hair color is processing and another one in your chair. And that's lovely in terms of the community that it creates and, um, and the conversation and the being together. But I think we're going to have to limit those interactions. And so it will be much more the service provider um, with one client at a time. And, and we've all talked about that as a community. We've already been having conversations about, you know, how we start to set those expectations with our, with our clients. Um, I'll throw out just a couple of questions that I would love to hear um, Fletch on, and, and these may not be things that we have answers for yet. Um, I think we have a pretty good handle on ha how hairstylists can work. Um, and that's a pretty manageable interaction as long as we have face masks on. Obviously, you can't maintain six feet of social distance when you're doing someone's hair. But if we are maintaining the cleanliness standards and we are um, making sure everybody has face masks, for example, I've already ordered a supply of extra face masks. So if a client shows up without a face mask, we've got some on site, that kind of thing. Um, wearing gloves at all times. So we can do those things. I guess one of the questions is for folks like um, those doing permanent makeup, um, tattoo artistry, basically, you know, tattooing permanent lipstick on or eyeliner, those kind of businesses where you're really in a face to face contact or estheticians, skincare, um, those kinds of services. Um, and lash, uh, you know, eyelash extensions that are really popular services. Um, I think we would really welcome advice on how we make sure our practitioners and our clients maintain safety um, to the extent possible um, in those, in those um, you know, more intimate interactions. So I'll stop. I know we've got lots of other really capable people in different lines of work, um, different businesses on the, on the phone, but. 
Fletch, do you want to, to hold on to the, your ideas related to that, or would you like to speak to them now? Um, I'll speak real quickly about a couple of those because it might answer some other questions as we're going through. Um, one, th the masks are great. I just want to briefly talk about that. We're being really specific with public health when we're using the term mask. We're talking about specifically a surgical mask, or if we talk about respirators, like an N95 respirator. The guidance we're currently pushing and the state's pushing and the CDC is pushing is a strong recommendation for cloth face coverings, which is not necessarily a mask. It could be anything from a bandana to like a folded t-shirt to like some of the hand stitched face coverings you've seen really popular to like the little neck gaiters. So that's, that's our strong recommendation right now. Concerns are that um, if you have masks and you get surgical loop masks or other masks, that's great but we want to try to conserve those as much as we can for first responders and medical professionals, because there still is a scarcity, there's still a shortage. You know, supply chains are getting back online for those, but as the nation starts reopening and people are starting to buy those up again, we expect more scarcity. The, the, one of the benefits of the cloth face coverings is that you can wash them. So you could have two use one day and wash the other one and alternate them. And that can last you for weeks and months through the duration of this as opposed to traditional medical grade PPE, you really have to have some specialized equipment to sanitize them and wash them. And they might be good for a week, maybe two, but they're gonna degrade and lose their form and integrity. So we're, we're using the term cloth or just face, face coverings, um, different than how we're using masks now. I just wanna make you guys aware of that. But that, that's gonna be the key. Um, this group is really unique because <clears throat> some other industries have opportunities to do physical distancing but by the nature of your guys work like it's a lot of these things can't provide service delivery without being in that close contact criteria and so yeah <clears throat> um, masks or face coverings or gloves um, limiting exposure limiting people so if the, you're, you are in that close contact and it's only just two people it's not going to be more than two right it, is it the way forward on that and I, I can address that more later i just wanted to touch real briefly because i imagine some other people might be bringing up the same issues. Great, thank you. Well, yeah. let's move to, to Kevin Crop of Club Pilates. Um, Kevin, first of all, did we get your audio worked out? Oh no, I still can't hear you. I, I hate this, I'm so sorry, we can't hear you. So um, perhaps you could enter some ideas into chat or try and get on the phone, but we still can't hear you. Let's move on to, uh, to Jen Locke Charlton with Sensibilities Day Spa. Jen, do um, you want, want to share your thoughts, please? Um, it's a lot of what Elizabeth said. The flow of it is going to be the most difficult part for us to figure out, I think. Um, both of our locations have the capacity to do five treatments in the actual closed off spa rooms. And then our nail section, um, it's upstairs, still in its own area, but we have two nail techs and two clients at a time. So I'm a little concerned about how we're going to stagger those and how we're gonna distance um, employees and clients from each other. So I, I guess it's gonna be easier to figure out once we know how many people and have a little bit more um, guidance from the CDC and the Department of Health. Um, but we definitely plan on staggering services. Um, we'll do everything we can to keep clients apart. Our south location in Biltmore Park has a small client waiting area upstairs, but we, have, we can make use of the Hilton's lobby if we need to, to have people wait there and we can go get them. Um, downtown has a bigger space up front. So I think as clients check in or check out, we'll be able to keep them apart. Um, but the nail area is definitely the biggest thing I'm worried about, especially since those are our most popular treatments and that's what we're getting the most requests for right now. Um, I definitely don't want us to open until it's time to open as our clients trust us. I know all of you feel the same way. We wanna do it when it's safe and we definitely wanna have really good guidelines um, so far. Universal Companies is a supplier that we use for a, a, a lot of our different spa supplies. And they had a seminar that went through checklists for each of our departments, including front desk, 
retail, aesthetics. Um, they had cosmetology, which we don't actually do hair, but they had a list for everyone. And I'll be getting together with my department heads and we'll fine tune those for what works exactly for us. And I just, I think those are important because whenever you're trying to do something in a different way or in a new way, a checklist really helps for all of us. So they'll be, um, they'll be posted, they'll be given to our employees along with their client daily sheets, their schedules, um, so they can go over them through the day, they can check off what they've been able to get done and what they need to do, and then turn them into us until, at least until it's second nature. Um, it's just gonna be really different I was talking to another um, spa person, Roberta from Shoji yesterday, and both of us just, we know it's gonna be really different. And as much guidance as we can get reopening, it would be really helpful that we're gonna do everything that we can as far as sanitation, disinfection. Um, our industry already has pretty stringent standards about that. And of course, we'll make them as, as stringent as we can because we really want to keep our clients safe and keep want to keep my employees safe and we want to keep their trust. Um, so the concerns that I have, I, I saw that you're going to help us know where to get supplies. Um, and it, it sounds like Fletch, what you were saying that we can use fabric masks for our employees. Um, I wasn't sure if we'd be able to do that or if we did have to get separate paper masks, you know, disposable ones for each client that our employees see, but we're definitely gonna ask all of our clients to wear masks as they come in. Um, the people that can't wear a mask during their service, we'll still we'll ask them to wear it in when they check in at the front desk and they'll take it off once they actually get into the treatment room. So that will help with exposure to other clients um, and to my, my front desk as well. I think we're just, we're, we're waiting for a little more guidance. Um, one of my nail techs, she had a question about how do we screen clients? Um, I, we're gonna send an email out to everyone as their confirmation where it asks them, of course, don't come in if you're not feeling well, um, reminds them about the mask you know, and gives them an idea of the different steps that we're taking. Um, but how do we actually screen them? Um, I'm thinking of only starting with locals and regulars at the beginning, since we're going to have limited capacity anyway, I'm assuming. Um, we just, we want to know the best way to make sure that we are staying as safe as we can as far as the clients that we get scheduled. Um, let's see what else I have. Those are some really good questions, Jen. Let's, um, Fletch, do you want to respond to any of them at this point? Yeah, was, I, got, I got a lot of stuff I'll talk about, but I'll go ahead and let Arnaldo go, and that's why I catch everything at the end going that's forward. Great. But those, yeah, I got some, uh, brought some great points there, and I'll, um, I'll address those, Jen. Thanks. Okay. Um, Jen, do you have anything else, or do you want to? Uh... Those are the main things. I think just all of us need a little bit more guidance as far as how many people can be in a certain area of our spas. Um, just... So I mean, we can't really make a plan on how to stagger appointments, on how to schedule, um, how much time to leave in between until we have a little bit more guidance on that. Good, very good points. Arnaldo, how about you? Um, hey, uh, first I just wanna say thank you for uh, hosting this. I think this is great. Um, it's always nice to have as much information as possible and it's always great to know that you know, all of our game plans are kind of in line with what the regulations and, and rules for Asheville are going to be. Um, I can say that, uh, you know, it's been definitely a challenge owning a, a functional fitness facility, uh, hosting 11 classes a day, and then switching to a completely virtual platform essentially overnight. Um, and so we have been live streaming all of our classes uh, via Zoom um, so that people can work out from home. And so our plan um, is to continue doing that um, until we are able to fully reopen, um, just to make sure that there um, is no overflow or people that are unable to attend any of our classes uh, here in the gym. And uh, essentially what we're gonna do 
based on the number of people we're allowed to have in our facility, um, which I don't know, a question I have, uh, you know, for you to answer is, it's going to be determining, uh, is a determining factor going to be uh, square footage? Um, you know, we do have a garage bay door that we can keep open. We have double doors in the back. So, you know, there's a lot of room for open airflow as opposed to a traditional gym like Gold's or the YMCA where everything is kind of you know, sequestered into one room with air conditioning flowing and having all that air circulate with, within that particular room. So uh, that would be a question that I have, but uh, based on the number of um, people we're allowed to have, um, we're going to create workout stations. We, you know, kind of just dubbed them wad pods, uh, where essentially um, everything's going to be six feet apart. They'll be walking uh, paths to everyone's uh, particular station. Um, everyone will have the set equipment for that particular mm -hmm. workout, um, along with a um, you know, a bottle of hand sanitizer slash bleach um, that will have disposable, you know, paper towels that can uh, clean up after themselves as soon as everything's done so that we can make sure that everything stays as sanitary as possible. Um, you know, I'm sure just like most gyms in town, we, we keep the cleanliness level very high, um, but, you know, obviously we're, we're on high alert with everything that's going on right now. Um, another thing that we have... Um, Decided to do just by working very closely with our corporate figure uh, down in Florida, um, we've decided to get one of the uh, no touch uh, thermometers. So um, everyone's going to basically get tested as best we can when they come in, um, you know, practicing as, as much social responsibility as we can to make sure that, um, you know, if anyone has a fever or anything like that, we just send them away, um, you know, but obviously request that our members be smart about anything they're doing when, you know, coming into a social setting like that. Um, we're also going to ask our parent members uh, to refrain from bringing in their kids um, for at least a month um, of when we reopen, uh, just because anyone who has kids know that they will not practice social distancing and they'll touch everything and um, we definitely want to make sure we mitigate any um, contagious uh, you know touching as, as much as we can um, we've also have been blessed with a very large parking lot that's flat outside and so we have talked to see whether you know again once we know what the capacity is inside the gym hosting parking lot uh, workouts as well, um, spacing everyone six feet apart, making sure people park in a designated area so that we can utilize the majority of our parking spaces to accommodate as many people as we are able to uh, accommodate. Um, we, of course, stocked up on hand sanitizer, sanitizing products, bleach, um, just making sure that we have a surplus of that um, just because we are going to be using it you know, 11 times a day times however many workout stations we have. So we wanted to make sure that we have a full supply uh, of everything so we don't run out of anything. Um, and then what we're going to ask is that anyone who attends one of our classes just wait in their cars until the previous class is dismissed so that we can make sure that, again, um, everyone is practicing as, as close to social distancing as, as they possibly can. Um, so that's kind of our, our game plan uh, for now, kind of pending whatever those numbers would be. Um, one, or I kind of had three questions is, um, you know, the hand sanitizer is, is really the, the hardest thing I think to get uh, right now. And so I didn't know if you guys had any plans to um, kind of stockpile, uh, you know, dispensers or particular hand sanitizing, you know, stations so that we can kind of uh, make sure that we maintain, you know, safe regulations. Um, the next question I have is, um, I know you're recommending everyone wear cloth face masks or possibly gloves um, in a workout capacity that is very difficult to ask somebody to wear a mask while also trying to, you know, get their heart rate up and breathe real heavy. So I didn't know if you had um, any rules and regulations on that or any suggestions as how to, um, you know, maintain that. Um, and the last one I have is kind of a financial question. Um, you know, when we're talking about cycling and shifting our employees to making sure that, um, you know, we, we have very low numbers in the gym. Um, I, as well as I'm sure many people on this call, applied for a PPP loan. Um, and so, you know, we have to pay our employees or, you know, have to have some kind of maintenance, uh, you know, 75% of that without making, you know, that another financial burden on us. So I don't know what your suggestions were as to trying to have a full capacity um, employee line, as well as, you know, maintaining this kind of um, 10 person limit or 20 person, whatever, you know, whatever that's going to be, um, you know, in the future. So uh, those, those were pretty much it for, for me. Great. Ar Arnold, oh, thank you very much for that. I want to see if we can try Kevin again to see if we get, have, if he has gotten his audio working. Kevin, are you Is there? This 
Can you hear me this time? I can hear you. Excellent. So All right. No it only took five times. <laughs> I use Zoom every day. It only took five times. <laughs> um, so, you know, Arnaldo said a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, and before, before all of this started, we purchased a lot of uh, things to know that, you know, customers don't have to touch, like uh, the wipes that we use to clean reformer. So I own Pilates Studio. So, I mean, we have two here in Asheville, one in Biltmore Park, one in uh, on Charlotte Street. So we had, you know, 500 to 600 people coming, um, you know, daily. Um, th that's how many people are coming in and out of the studio. I mean, it used to be uh, 12 people leaving a class, 12 people taking a class, maybe a couple people hanging around from an earlier class, 30 people in a little lobby. So we know that's a thing of the past. Um, six people in a class, all the reformers are now six feet apart. So if we only have six people in a class, everyone will stay at least 10 or 12 feet apart. Um, we've purchased, uh, yesterday we bought 200 sets of straps for all of our members. Um, so our members are going to need to use, bring their own straps to their reformer. That's the one piece of equipment everyone will touch. Um, you know, the reformer itself can be wiped off with sanitizer and we can pretty much guarantee that that's t totally clean. Classes will be five minutes short uh, at the front and the end. So 10 minutes to clean every piece of equipment. Um, and since we have limited people in the classes, we'll rotate. So, you know, reformer one gets used first class, next class, the next reformer next to it. So there'll be an hour in between reusing the reformer. Um, you know, every, we have, we've bought face masks that people can buy for $10 and they're cloth face masks. They're washable, reusable, and they're kind of branded. They look nice. Um, so we have, we have that. We have a big stand-up um, sanitizer station that's also branded that's in the front of the studio, so it's easy to see and use, and everyone will need to use it before and after. Um, and we were already doing things like wash your hands. When you walk in the door, you go wash your hands, and when you leave, you wash your hands if, if you want to. But when a customer leaves, it'll be the next business's job to have them wash their hands with soap and water. Um, what else? Instructors will not be, you know, putting their hands on members. I mean, it's usually a hands-on type of thing in Pilates, but we've stopped all hands-on cueing. Um, we did that before we shut down. Instructors will use a microphone and a headset so you know people can hear them clearly. Um, I think that's about it. I mean, reduced classes, you know, instead of 50 classes, 55 classes a week, it'll probably be 30. Um, and we'll see how many, how many people are ready to get back out and, uh, and exercise and, you know, Hopefully they know that when they walk in our door, they're not going to get sick from co having come to our studio. Arnaldo brings up a good point about breathing and exercising with a face mask on. And I've been trying to do that lately. And, and I can tell you it's a little bit difficult, but um, it might be something that we're all just going to have to do if we want to keep up with our athletics. Well, I think I that's about it. Thank you, Kevin. That's great. I'm glad we were able to, to get your audio working. It, what strikes me about all of you is, is the level of thought you've been giving to how to adapt. And I think that's the same kind of thought that all business owners are going to have to have because there are uh, distinguishing characteristics to every type of business. And it's going to be really important to do that. I've noted in the chat that, uh, that people would like more notice of when they'll be able to reopen. And I think it's gonna be important. I think we'll be able to see through the stages that it's coming, but don't let that stop you from going ahead and doing your planning. Um, Fletch, would you like to respond to some of the questions? I mean, perhaps what we could do is, is go to the, the, uh, the first question, the next slide, so that people can begin to populate the Zoom chat with with sharing their ideas and strategies that could benefit your industry in reopening and Fletch perhaps you could go ahead and respond to some of the questions you've already heard yeah so actually I got a lot of stuff to talk about from those conversations um, not organized in any particular order but just as I heard them come up um, but it's really encouraging to hear from you from you guys sharing that how proactive you guys are being and how thoughtful and thinking about that so it makes us feel better to know like that level of thought and care has been put into this process um the idea of managing flow is great um 
being able to close doors to prevent people from congregating is good, but we always want to be careful that you're not locking doors and anything that's going to um, result in a fire code violation or possibly lock people in a building in some way, right? So a lot of people are limiting entrances and exits, but we never want to have a hard limit, like a locked door. We want to have some kind of barrier or signage or like tape or something, right? Um, a really good point was brought out about lobbies and waiting areas. Um, what we're asking a lot of other industry sectors to do is depend on the size of it, you might need to ask people to start waiting in their cars and have some system in place beforehand, like whether you're gonna get their cell phone number and text them, it's okay to come in, or if there's some app or just guidance like, uh, um, like Arnardo was saying, like we let them know ahead of time, they need to stay in their cars until we fully dismiss the previous class or, you, or we walk out and you see us dismiss the previous client. So there's not that interaction period. So that's a really great idea. Um, in hand with that, is the proactive screening is a really best practice. So if you could do that the day before or in the day of, ahead of time before they show up, asking them how they're feeling, what their symptoms are like. Um, we do have a lot of people talking about taking temperatures. If you have the resources and the system in place to take people's temperatures, like with a scan thermometer as they come in, that's helpful. Um, we're not discouraging that, but we just want people to understand that the temperature taken aspect is only one piece of a, of a screening tool. So it, it can't be standalone just taking somebody's temperature. It also has to be a series of questions and we can point to some resources about their symptoms. The concern is if people start depending too much on just the temperature, maybe 50 to even send some studies, 75% of the people who have COVID will never display a fever. So if maybe people are feeling one or two symptoms, they're like, oh, I'm not feeling so good to have this. And they take a temperature and it's a 98 or 99. They might get this false sense of security. So we just want to make sure our approach to screen is holistic, asking questions about symptoms and erring on the side of caution. A lot of reasons people can be coughing and stuff these days, but this is the time that just, sorry, you might be coughing because of allergies, but you know we're, we're going to err on the side of caution here. Um, so there were some discussions about, so I'll talk about guidance real quick. Um, I see some of the questions in chat about guidance for exercise classes and stuff. We don't know yet what the governor's guidance is gonna be, how it's gonna play out, how he's gonna work. Is he gonna determine capacity similar to how he did with uh, groceries as a number of your fire code capacity, occupancy numbers? Is it gonna be based on square footage? We don't have any insight into that yet. Um, so, but as we do, we're gonna craft it um, and push it out in an inf informative way so all you guys in the different industries can start planning as soon as possible. We just don't have that yet, but we're expecting it um, hopefully soon. Um, part of that though, we really wanna do, that's come up in all these town halls, we're working really hard and we got the gears turning already to create a comprehensive and cohesive countywide communications plan for the entirety of the reopening process. And that's, not only helping business owners, but the community understand what the different phases mean, not, not only what they mean, but give them some reassurance of the steps that are be ta being taken by all of you guys to, to ensure their safety. Because we know that even if you guys open your doors, there might be a lot of people who still won't feel comfortable coming out for your services. So as we, as we meet that criteria, we want to let everyone know the steps that are being taken countywide to assure them, you know, we're, we're working hard to keep them safe. Um, we're looking at kind of some branding for that because we, we've had the stay home, stay safe campaign in the order so far. So we're looking at a stay local, stay safe in the next phase. And then also maybe potentially a spend local campaign, kind of all encourage people to get out and work in the local community and uh, re-engage you guys as you're allowed to open up. Um, Jen, you brought up something that I thought was a really good idea talking about the checklists. Standard operating procedures are going to go work really well for you guys going forward for your staffs as you're working through all these things. So if you have a series of things they have to clean between each client or between each shift or all these different new well, things that are new to their daily procedures, codifying those in an SOP with a checklist that they can go through to make sure they're hitting everything, it's going to be really helpful for your staff and for clients if you have it on their side. If you have patrons coming in, they need to be responsible for different things let them know and give them some sheet or have it up on the wall where they know they're doing what they're 
need to be responsible for. Mass guidance. So I don't necessarily think, in my interpretation, and what I think we're saying locally, that people need to be wearing the mask during the physical activity during the classes if you guys are still conforming to the, if you can meet the six feet criteria. Um, not, not positive, the governor's not gonna say that, so we'll see. But I think the intention we're thinking is that encouraging people to wear some kind of face covering as they go throughout the community, as they enter certain businesses, certain sectors of the industry, where, you, like restaurants, for example, where you have to eat, or at a gym where you're working out, probably be able to remove those face coverings for the duration there, um, as long as we're meeting other criteria, I think. Um, and then hand sanitizers, we're looking, we have a lot of local distilleries and people making local um, hand sanitizer. We're trying to work in a plan in our emergency operations center to make that available and kind of promote that in some ways so that we can get that local hand sanitizer. So we're asking people, if you have small hand sanitizer dispensers, don't throw those away right now because there may be some process in the future that we can refill those. Um, but we're working on towards that end. And, uh, and the gloves, I don't think necessarily for staff maybe, for, but for gyms or as people coming in for services, we've never pushed gloves as guidance. The best thing is still just good hand hygiene, hand washing. There are certain industries and sectors where they're handling th certain things at a very high rate that gloves might be recommended. But we, at Public Health and CC have not pushed gloves in general yet. And then I, one th last thing I want to get into before I start going, I'll turn it back to Kit for a second, and then later we can answer the questions in chat. But I do have, I think, some good news for some of you guys, but I want to temper it first and let you know that to understand that this is I still need you guys to really focus on the safety aspect, but today we're signing a new version of our stay home, stay safe order, which changes our mass gathering guidance to allow for groups up to 10 people to, to align with the governor's order. So what that means, you still have to comply with the six feet social distancing. That doesn't necessarily mean your business can be open if it's what it is, but if you have outdoor areas or facilities where you can get a group of 10 together to partake in something, whether it's a parking lot or a space or a big enough gym that you can consider if you can meet the rest of the criteria, engage in that. And Great. that goes into effect tomorrow morning. Good, well, that's, that's good news. Every little step, right? Right, it's just one small step we're working towards um, slowly and so, before I turn it back over to Kit, I want to say one more thing. Um, we're acutely and painfully aware of the impacts these decisions have on you guys, on local economy, on local business owners. And I just want to assure you that in every phase of this, every conversation we're having, every decision-making process, that's a factor we're weighing. And we're doing the best we can to balance safeguarding public health with you know, people's livelihoods, and uh, you know, people's source of income, and we're doing the best we can. So, I just want to assure you guys that that conversation is part of every decision-making process. Great, thank you, Fletch. Yeah. In preparation for this, y'all brought up many of the ideas I've seen um, shared online. I went on the internet and looked at at uh, if there was guidance that existed, and there um, we've already had. Ellis Vaughn from Health and Human Services has shared a link about symptoms. I, there is also that OSHA has a guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19 that might be helpful to you. I noticed that there are particular um, magazines and things related to salon industry, for example, who have checklists that can be included. One thing I didn't hear anybody say, but I thought this was a really good idea. If you've got a reception area that has magazines or newspapers or things that like service menus that people would touch, the suggestion is to remove them. So uh, perhaps that would be another idea that you could incorporate. And then even across industries are talking about ways to uh, avoid the exchange of cash while we still have to allow people to use cash because not all have av availability of credit cards. The way you handle, the way you sanitize after handling cash is a really important thing as well. 
and um, making sure that you've got, uh, that you're thinking about every aspect of your business, including the restrooms and, and um, the door handles and all those types of things. And Elizabeth, you mentioned Barbicide. They also have a link about sanitation protocols that can be utilized. There are also some large chains that have, um, have information and there's the National Retail Federation also has a blueprint for, uh, for shopping safe. So you can borrow things from other industries. We're including all those links in with information and the recording, the chat from this particular section will be on the Asheville Chambers um, coronavirus page. So it's ashevillechamber.org slash coronavirus and we'll be posting all of those things for, uh, for your use and, and to share with others. Let's talk for a minute. Let's go to the next slide. I, I want to understand, many of you talked about the various types of um, cleaning products, face, face uh, what would you call them, Fletch? You did, said we're not supposed to call them masks face coverings, face coverings. Um, and it, we've heard on other town halls that there are local providers who are making some of those things. So we're collecting links to those as well. So if you become aware of a source, we'd very much like to hear about it. I'm interested in, um, in whether or not uh, our folks in the audience have had difficulty in getting their hands on resources. And um, Elizabeth, I'm also was really interested in the fact that you've been using green products, but you're moving away from green products. I hate to say that, but at least temporarily. Well, <laughs> I think we'll probably have to use some things that pack a little bit more punch, um, or at least with more certainty. I mean, I feel like the green products we've used have been very effective, but I just you know, with, with so much unknown about this virus and how it spreads and um, so much new information coming out on a regular basis about how long it can live on various surfaces, we'll probably be using more, you know, chlorinated and products like that, that, um, you know, that the CDC has recommended will be um, a better certainty, I guess. Um, and, and hopefully like a lot of these things, that's just for a period of time. Um, to to one of, one of your points in terms of sanitation, like we've always just used hand dryers, and before this um, before we got closed down at the end of March, we had gone ahead and invested in um, paper towel dispensers for our restrooms. Um, and put them right next to the doors to the restrooms. So people who don't wanna to have to touch a doorknob after they wash their hands. Um, another thing that we're gonna install is the hands-free door openers where I think you can hook your foot in it and pull it open. So things like that, um, in addition to the, the cleaning, just you know, stuff that we, as a matter of general practice, had not done before. Um, that so I've ordered all the hand hand um, the uh, sorry paper towel um, dispensers and you know hand sanitizer dispensers in the hallway. Um, I ha I did have luck finding those uh, dispensers on Amazon this week, so I ordered those. And then getting the actual product to go in them is a little bit more challenging, but it seems like that that's becoming more available um, through a, bro a broader variety of sources. So we'll try to keep that there. Um, and Fletch, don't worry, we're not locking the door so that you can't get out. <laughs> we, we have a security system that allows us to schedule the, the unlocking of the doors automatically. So you'll always be able to get out. <laughs> I didn't want to scare you there. <laughs> well, I, and again, if you are aware of resources that you need that you can't find, if you would list them in the chat, we're going to make an effort to find sources of information. The Dogwood Health Trust which has been involved in providing PPE for healthcare is interested in also whether or not there are items that you're having difficulty getting and are looking into whether or not they can provide some 
bulk purchasing so that those types of things can be provided, but we would need to know what you're unable to get. Elizabeth, I'm, I'm assuming that your source for green products also was able to provide you with, uh, with the stronger stuff. I, I purchased all, all of it through my um, cleaning company, which is a local firm called The Cleaning Lady, and they do all of that for me. Right. Um, I was on the on the items that we need, you know, on this question of um, face coverings versus face masks, for example, in order to provide, um, to make sure our clients have a face mask on while they're getting their hair done, and you know, you're in very close proximity to them or getting, you know, if a barber is shaving you or something like that. Um, one of the ways that, I mean, one of the things that all of my salon owners are trying to procure is the ear loop face mask because they can still do hair. It may be a little bit more challenging, but that you can still do hair and do hair color if somebody's wearing a face loop. You can't do it if they, you know, you can't, you can't wash somebody's hair and cut it if it has the strings that tie up behind your head. So, um, so, you know, if, if people are locally making ones with the band that, you know, I would love a source for those because that is a hard thing to find. I've ordered some of the, you know, regular ones because Sola has found a source that they have, um, the corporate team has found a source that they've provided to all of us locally. Um, so I did order some of those, but I do know that those are in, you know, in great demand and are really need to be reserved for people who are on the front lines in medical profession. Um, so we would totally take a cloth mask resource with ear loops if somebody has that. Well, and I know that the, the industry source.com has been, is, has all kinds of PPE. I don't know if they have the ear loop version of the, the face coverings, but that is a source that's been listed in the in the chat. And I'm aware that there are other folks, some people have even used it as a branding opportunity and are um, <laughs> using, stitching logos on those face, those face coverings that can be worn around. What about the rest of you? Any other, any other resources um, or Arnaldo, Jen, uh, Kevin, any ideas of things that you are finding it's more difficult to get? Um, just, just for me right now, the hand sanitizer and the dispensers are the hardest thing to find. Um, face masks, we've just been using cloth ones ourselves. Um, you know, because we run outside a lot in the gym, uh, even when it's cold outside, a lot of our members already have buffs and, um, you know, things like that that we can utilize. So I haven't really specifically been looking for face masks, um, only because the regulations have suggested coverings, as, as uh, Fletch mentioned, and not specifically face masks themselves. Um, we don't really have a need for that in, in our industry. Jen, anything? Hand sanitizer, I think that is still the hardest thing to find. Um, and gloves, depending on if we have to use a lot of them or not. Um, it's difficult to give a massage or a facial with gloves and we have sinks in every room. So, um, and even before all this, we want clients to know we're washing our hands before, during and after services. So I don't know how many gloves we'll have, but I have a feeling those will be hard to find too if we need them. Um, here's a question uh, for Fletch. You can, might wanna answer this, this one. Uh, as an esthetician, my concern is mucous membrane eye exposure that cloth masks won't protect being in such close contact. Do you feel it's necessary for practitioners, estheticians, nail techs, permanent makeup artists, lash technicians to wear face shields during service treatments? Yeah, I think that's a probably a really good idea. Um, that there we have some local sources that are making some face shields for us i've also seen some different uh online resources that how you can kind of craft your own from some common office supplies if you need to but that's stuff where you're going to be right up in somebody's face much as as like a dentist might be um those face shields on top of with a mask always on top of a mask are probably a really good idea okay we'll look and see um there's yeah. also a comment in the chat that Med Express, located in Fletcher has a variety of gloves as a resource for people who need gloves. Um, let's move, go ahead, I'm sorry. 
That's fine. Good. Um, let's move to the next question. Which what gaps still remain based on current guidelines? If anybody has ideas um, after you've heard a lot of this, are there ideas that uh, questions you still have based on the current guidelines? Any of uh, our let's go ahead. I was gonna say while we're waiting for some input on that, let me go ahead and. I see some questions up earlier. Um, so uh, again, for guidance for group exercise classes, waiting for more details from the governor of how that'll work. Like I said, locally, as of as of tomorrow morning, we're gonna we're gonna sign it today. But tomorrow morning, we'll be going to his ten people mass gathering guidance. Um, uh, for Crystal, she's asking about more notice. Um, Crystal, uh, sorry you got such late notice last time. I would recommend you follow like Buncombe County government on social media and watch our, our media updates. Um, Cause we, we gave 96 hour notice last time that we had intentions to go to that order. And then we gave a full, I think it was 28 hours about notice from the time we actually signed the order into effect before it went into effect. So uh, just make sure you're plugged into county government, um, social media and sources so you can get that and we're pushing, we'll be pushing stuff as, as soon as we know. Unfortunately, the governor is going to be driving a lot of this process going forward. So as, as soon as he puts out guidance, we'll, we'll push it to you guys. And then as soon as we know we're going to a different phase, when that's data set or guidelines for that, we'll, we'll push that out to the community so you guys can start planning. Let's see the most recent question from Nikki down yeah. at the bottom. Yeah, so um, more so 10 people mass gatherings update. Um, as of right now, it's still for essential services and it's, um, it's still required to do the six feet, um, six feet with proper hygiene and sanitation practices. Um, so how you look at the guidance about um, if essential versus non-essential determines whether that, that could be applicable. Um, I do I do want to point out that the governor phase one, um, he seems to be looking to, he, we're still going to be in the stay home order, but it looks like the language he's using is going to relax some restrictions on what's essential and non-essential activity. So um, we're looking for some more guidance on that. We're also not clear from what he's saying is whether we're going to go ahead and go to phase one on May 9th, which is coming up pretty soon or we have to go by the metrics he laid out for 14 day period of downward trends before we get to phase one. Because if that's the case, we're already looking beyond May 9th for going to phase one, but we're just not clear on that. So don't, I don't wanna make any interpretation on that yet. Fletch, I was on a call, statewide call yesterday with Mandy Cohen and she indicated that unless things go awry that we may be moving into phase one next week which would be good news. Now that's not official news, that's just what, yeah. what I heard from her, but we can be hopeful that that's the case. Um, yeah, I, we, we can always be hopeful and cautiously optimistic and start that planning process, but I just want everybody to understand that as it was laid out, you know, it's windows all the way into late June, early July. Well, and I've become a, um, a, a Facebook fan of Buncombe County government, they show a literal, the, the literal updates. And y'all are doing those twice a week. Is that correct, Fletch? Yeah, so we're still doing Mondays and Thursdays. So our next one's today at 2.30. They're always at 2.30. And you can follow those on Facebook Live on either the, the government, Buncombe County government homepage. And also WLOS carries those live. I also want everyone to know that today it's live now, but we've launched a Buncombe County COVID-19 self-checker. So if you or anyone, your staff or clients might think that has some symptoms or concerned about a possible exposure even to COVID-19, um, they could go to there. It's quick, it's easy, it's absolutely confidential, and it can connect them to resources, let them know what their symptoms align to, potentially connect them to testing resources, and it's gonna help us collect a lot of data so we know what we're looking at in the community, which we haven't had great data on that so far. So going forward, as we get input on that, it can help us determine, you know, the extent at which we're reopening stuff 
the whether whether or not we're what we're looking at in the county that's a great resource and um my colleague tommy dennison has shared that h and h distillery has hand sanitizer so uh if you and that the local upholstery business pit stop trim shop has pivoted to offer face masks and there is a link for both of those in the chat uh, pitstoptrimshop.com and hhdistillery.com as resources. Again, all of this will be on our website, astralchamber.org. If we can go to the next slide. Um, I want to make sure we're running out of time here. I thank you so much for participating. I want to thank our, our panelists, Elizabeth Maylander, Kevin Kropp, Jen Charleston, and Arnaldo Alvarez, as well as Fletch Toe for participating. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your questions. And you can continue to share your thoughts and questions if you will email business at buncombecounty.org. That will be um, seen by the, the health department staff. And then uh, one other opportunity I would like to present, we have did a survey early on through the chamber and shared that information with our local decision makers. And it was super helpful to understand where business was on particular things. We're now doing a second survey. It's also available at astralchamber.org slash coronavirus. So please go there and take the survey to let us know what your business issues are. We're sharing those not only with our local folks, but our state elected officials who are currently in session and making decisions that will impact all of us as time goes forward. Um, I want to thank you again for participating. I know that together we are more resilient and I appreciate you joining us. So thank you and have a great day.